awesome. My name is Aurelia Maraca. I'm the Technology Program Coordinator at the Danbury Library in Danbury, Connecticut, and I welcome uh, all of you to the virtual Western Connecticut UFO Conference panel discussion with special guest Dr. Bill Burns of uh, History Channel's UFO Hunters and publisher of UFO Magazine and many other books and publications and documentaries. And we also have uh, our fellow UFO presenters from uh, yesterday and also uh, today. So I welcome all of you. Everyone just wants to sort of say hi and your, your name and, you know, and everything just so as an introduction. Live long and prosper. I can't do that. <laughs> oh, this? There you go. Uh, there we go. Well, you probably couldn't see as my hand went into the ether, but whatever. Do you, uh, do you know what that sign means? Uh, no. Well, now now okay. we will. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to find out. <clears throat> I knew this. I can't remember, though. It, sure it, you do. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a Jewish Leonard symbol. Nimoy, Gene Roddenberry. I, I knew Leonard Nimoy. Gene Roddenberry. I, I wrote for Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry asked, he was looking around for some kind of salutation, greeting, something yeah, like um, of friendship for the Vulcans. So Leonard Nimoy uh, was a Russian Jew. And Nimoy said, well, in, in, in Orthodox Judaism, um, there are different, um, depending upon your tribe, right? There are different tribes. There are 12 tribes. So depending upon your tribe, um, there was one tribe called the Kohanim, who were the priests in ancient Israel. They were the first priests. They were the children of Aaron, Moses' brother. And what they did, when they would give the blessing, because they were priests, when they would give the blessing to the congregation, they would, um, they'd be inside a prayer shawl, which is a talus, they'd, they'd um, cover their eyes, and they would hold their hands up, um, spreading their fingers apart. That was the sign of the Kohanim. And they would hold them out like this to the congregation, covered by the prayer shawl, when they would give the prayer. And so when Leonard Nimoy, who was a Kohen, showed that to supposedly only Kohens can do that. I have arthritis, I can't do it anymore. But um, when Leonard Nimoy showed that to Gene Roddenberry, he said, perfect, that's the salutation for Vulcans. And that's how they got it. And that's what it means. And that's how they got it. Well, we're speechless. Yeah. It's like, wow. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I have a question. Let's see. This is a question for Linda Zimmerman. This is from Justin. Uh, why is it that the Hudson Valley region of New York has so many UFO sightings? Okay, that is easy to answer. I don't know. <laughs> um, I suspect, well, I know it's gone back well over 100 years. So it has to do something with this area, um, whether it's the minerals, the natural earth fields here, um, I don't know, but it seems they follow certain paths, and so there must be some way they're utilizing this area and have been doing so for a lot longer than we've been recording them, I'm sure. Uh, can I especially, tell you on that for a minute? Especially course. recently with the uh, Indian Point flyover. That was a big one. Yeah, I was going to ask about the nuclear reactor. Yeah, yes, because that, it... Be Go ahead. Yeah, that reactor is being decommissioned in the next year or two. So I'll be very interested to see if there's any other sort of activity as they are decommissioning it. Of course, they have 60 years to remove all the nuclear material. Oh. But uh, yes, but they plan on doing it quicker. So I'm wondering if we'll have some eyes on that as they're doing it. There might be a point regarding the Bouger anomaly. Uh, is anyone familiar with that? No. Okay. We were, uh, we've been researching that in uh, part of our, what we call our flap area research. And we found that uh, in areas of intense 
activity, paranormal or other, you know, or UFOs, et cetera, that the Bouger anomaly is, is present. Uh, in Connecticut, for example, in uh, the um, area of what that we refer to as the Litchfield Triangle, we've been researching for the last 15 years, Ben's, one of Ben's first cases, uh, we found that the Bouger anomaly is, the stro is stronger than anywhere else in Connecticut. And what, what that is, is that, um, and it's a principle used by engineers to try and locate oil and gas deposits. If you walk down uh, a hill into a valley, you would expect that gravity would be a little bit um, more, a little stronger because you're closer to the center of the earth. It wouldn't be measurable, but it, it can. But actually when the Bouger anomaly is present, you actually get a little bit lighter as you walk down this hill into say a valley. And uh, there are, as I say, this is an accepted principle in science, and we just find a, a correlation between these flap areas and areas, this, and the Hudson Valley as well is full of the Bouger anomaly, and uh, river valleys very often are. And uh, we think this, there may be a correlation here because what, what did Einstein say about gravity? It bends space and time, even if just a little bit. So, so uh, we're currently working on that, and, and it's, it's a possibility that this may be a factor in areas like the Hudson Valley. So, Yeah, Yorktown that. Heights, which had uh, probably the most activity during the 1980s, is the, the, if you look on one of the gravitational anomaly maps, you could, it's a big circle directly over Yorktown Heights. So exactly. I see what you're saying. Do you, um, uh, this is from Lauren, uh, do any of the panelists have any thoughts on what's going on on that farm uh, that's in Litchfield County near Goshen? I think, Paul, you've been there. Uh, Paul and Ben. Uh, been let's say that, yeah. Um, our whole kind of crazy gang is working on that. That includes Shane and Shane Searway and uh, Mark D'Antonio. Uh, we, the, the, the most up-to-date information is that there are two more eyes, sets of eyes we have on that uh, through Connecticut MUFON. And um, just to give people backgrounds, uh, we in these flat areas, as we call them, are always running into the military or something that looks like the military. And our working theory is that we would love to uh, weaponize or at least otherwise be able to use the principles of paranormal and the multiverse uh, in order to um, accomplish whether it be commercial success or military success of some kind. This particular farm is not a farm. No farming uh, is done there. Uh, the land all around it is pretty much public land. The U.S. Army owns land across the road from it. It itself is owned by, uh, and Shane got into this uh, rather uh, in, in, in some uh, pretty uh, dazzling detail yesterday when he was speaking. Maybe he can address this too. But uh, yeah, th that's... Um, we're keeping an eye on that. We, as Shane referred, we had a, a contact in the intelligence community. Uh, we checked the address with him, and he uh, checked it and said to back off. There uh, were issues with um, a lot of strange things going on there. Uh, there, there, as I say, no farming. There was a lot of excavation a few years back, and uh, there was a huge metal sheet that was placed uh, over an area where excavation was was going on, and. Um, Shane, if you want to take it from there, I mean, you, you encountered the guy who established, uh, who installed all sorts of radio equipment that had no business being on a farm. Right. So I was talking about it in Southern New Hampshire during a conference at a library. And, and at the end, this gentleman approached me and he says, by chance, are you talking about the farm in, in Goshen? And I said, yeah, actually, he goes, I installed high tech radio equipment there. He goes, and I had no idea. The whole time, he never saw anybody. He was sent contracts. He, he went there, never saw anybody. Um, he's, he's installing this high-tech stuff, and he's like, why am I putting this stuff at a farm? It makes no sense at all. He says, it always just ate at me. And he goes, and now here I am listening to you, and boom, you know. And so I, I looked further um, into, you know, my with the help of my wife, too, who's, she works in banking, but she's a, her degree is a paralegal with the real estate realm. And, and so we, we dug up um, who purchased the land um, in 30 days after the land was purchased by this, the, these two people was when that radio tower was erected 30 days later. Um, it was also 
purchased for millions of dollars. And as you know, it was just that barn, the silos, um, that little bungalow house, and then some land. And it didn't make sense for the amount of money. It just told me that whoever owned it didn't want to sell it, but whoever wanted to buy it wanted to buy it really bad. And it was like 7 million or something like that, something crazy. And so it was a brother and sister that bought it. So I researched them. They're also part owners and their father's the main owner and controller of, a, of an aerospace um, company, uh, defense, co you know, contractor. And so they're the ones that own this. And as we know, you know, the, the when there's, I, I know somebody that was in special ops and, um, it, and everything. And he said that he's been, he knows of um, over 200 underground military bases. And he says that you'll never know that they're there. It could be a boarded up house, you know, whatever. Um, he said, but uh, they, they exist and um, and they always put it in, some, in either a contractor's name or somebody else's name. They'll never put it in their name. And so there you have it. I mean, uh, this this company, I, I'll just leave the name out of, of the name of the company, but it's a real aerospace um, defense corporation and um, that's who owns it. Yeah, and just to uh, emphasize, please do not trespass if you think you know where this is. The only other thing I can say at this point is that uh, many poltergeist-like phenomena have been reported on properties around this one. Uh, one family reported uh, that their barn doors were opening and closing rapidly. Things were moving in their house and they were quite frightened. Uh, another picture show, Shane showed yesterday was in this area of that, that creature, whatever it was, taken by a security camera standing in a sink. So uh, these are all, it, it's, a, it's an active investigation. Uh, there have been several producers who wanted to make a, a, a pilot or a series out of it. Uh, something has always come in and, from outside and stomped on it. So I'm not trying to be paranoid here, but who knows? So um, there's a lot going on. There's um, one of our uh, audience members asked, what is a flap? What is a flap area, Paul? Uh, well, ben, why don't you... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess the best way to describe it is essentially a sort of a, a place in which there's more than one sort of like paranormal sort of sphere happening at the same time, right? So essentially like, you know, a place where you have UFO activity, ghosts, poltergeists, Bigfoot, other cryptids, all sorts of stuff that's all happening at the same time, things that would normally be sort of, you know, pigeonholed out and shoved into the various different cubbies are now in one big cubby. And in, in that, you sort of see this flap area in which there's more than just one thing going on. A great example of this uh, is in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which everyone would probably recognize as sort of the home of Mothman. But at the same time as all of the Mothman phenomena was going on, there were strange lights seen in the sky, heightened psychic activity, you know, all sorts of other weird things happening all at the same time. And that was just, you know, a great example of it. And so this sort of area in Litchfield, Connecticut, we have all sorts of other stuff happening besides, you know, the military being involved and possible, you know, cryptids being seen all over the place, even one report of a Mothman being seen there, um, you know, paranormal activity, all, all, you know, up the wazoo, all sorts of things happening all at the same time. So flap area is essentially a collection of all these various cubbies being brought together into the big cubby, which is the flap area. And John we like to refer to them as, as window area. Also, the way we, like we try to think of like layers of an onion, and so if you put like food dye, and the uh, the dye kind of bleeds into each different layer. Those layers being those different like UFO, Bigfoot, haunted homes, they it, it bleed together and um, or bleed over, I should say, into one mm -hmm. another. And um, and so what what determines that is environmental factors, and we believe like rivers and streams, water bodies are a huge contributing factor to that those bleed overs. This, um, this is very similar to what's happening or what have, has happened at Skinwalker Ranch. And yes. uh, Bill, do you have any experience or can you uh, uh, talk to us about uh, the Skinwalker Ranch phenomena? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the Skinwalker Ranch has been a phenomenon for many, many years. People consider the Skinwalker, which is why... Um, which is why it's been bought and sold and bought and sold. It's guarded by, um, uh, 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 by the American military. It's not just private guards. <clears throat> There's actually a military there. Supposedly, 
the Skinwalker Ranch is a portal to another dimension. And folks who have observed that Skinwalker Ranch from afar have said there are strange creatures coming out of it. They've also said UFOs come out of it, out of that portal. And so that is one of the anomalies. What really um, interests folks is that why the government was so interested in this land in the first place. And so that's research that's still going on today. There's a great book by George Knapp, and I forget his co-writer's name. I've, I know him, but I forget the name for the time being, about the Skinwalker Ranch and about the history of the Skinwalker Ranch, the buying, the selling, the military guards, and most importantly, the videos of the strange creatures that are coming out of it. So if it is a portal, just like Marley Woods in Missouri, um, there in the Appalachians, there are places on this planet where scientists say that it's an entrance, it's a portal to another dimension with different creatures, and it's a seepage between the two dimensions. And that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and does anyone have anything to add to that on the panel? No? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So we have a uh, question from uh, uh, Gabe. Uh, what do you make of the root cellars in Western Connecticut and Southeast New York State? Are they really ancient and are they connected to, a, to the Hudson Vortex? Um, I will take that if, since I've written books about uh, these sites. Um, no, they're not root cellars. Some of them have been converted to that use. Uh, the reason a lot of um, archaeologists won't look at them is because there's so many wild rumors about them built by aliens, Vikings, Celtic monks. Um, everybody seems to overlook Native Americans who I believe built many stone sites throughout the area. And they're, most of them are astronomically aligned. And by that, I mean, uh, for instance, there's one only on the dawn of the winter solstice does sunlight come into the chamber and illuminate the back wall. You don't need to do that for potatoes. So um, it, clearly they're there for some ceremonial or, um, you know, very significant uh, purposes. Many of them, if not all of them, have been built on magnetic anomalies, natural earth field anomalies. So whoever built them was cognizant of that, had the ability to sense it, detect it, however they did it and felt that these places were where these sites needed to be built. That said, which sounds very basic, um, during the, again, the, the flap, the wave of the 1980s, you could literally stick pins in the map where these sites were, where there were concentrations of UFO activity. So I'm not saying these massive triangles were drawn to small stone sites, I'm saying that whatever the energies of these sites are, I believe that's what these UFOs were drawn to. So there is a definite correlation between the sites and the observed activity. Thank you, Linda. I have a question from Lauren, and this is directed uh, to all the panelists um, to give your thoughts on disclosure uh, and all of the, the, the recent news that we've gotten. Uh, and um, are you actually hoping to see some disclosure come out soon from the government on all the alien races or just one particular alien race that we've had in contact with the last 50 years? And I would like to give this one uh, first to uh, Bill and then uh, one by one, uh, give your thoughts. So go ahead. And this is about the different species of aliens that uh, we've come in contact with? 
Yeah, and a disclosure on that, because I still, you know, I'm not sure, you know, even myself personally, that I know we've had contact with the, uh, the Greys and the, uh, uh, the Viking uh, uh, aliens, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Are we going to have disclosure about one alien race or multiple alien races? Maybe some that are benevolent or maybe some that are not so benevolent. My theory about this is that <clears throat> very early in the history of this universe, there was a culture that had developed. And that culture had sent these, call them comets like Borisov and Oumuamua out across the universe. I actually don't believe that our present incarnation of the universe is the original universe that was formed after the Big Bang. Just to start from something basic, we keep looking for dark energy, the energy that's forcing all, this, all the elements of the universe apart, the entire universe. And we keep saying, well, here's dark energy, there's dark energy, who needs dark energy? But the other question, to, at least to my mind, is if there had been a Big Bang because of the buildup of energy in the universe, well, because the buildup of energy at the moment of the Big Bang, at some point over the timelessness of creation, wouldn't there be a big collapse? I mean, once you run out of the initial force that expanded you in the first place, wouldn't there be a collapse? And if there is a collapse, would time as we know it, which is what I believe, basically, time runs backwards. And if there is kind of a cellular memory, a consciousness that exists from expansion to contraction, from expansion to contraction, perhaps giving cell memory, the nature of consciousness, the um, uh, matter cannot be created or destroyed. Given all that, might it be that we live, we as a life form on this planet, probably other planets as well, live in a bath, a memory bath, from previous expansions and contractions. Mm -hmm. In other words, time can run backwards because we would have that memory. And there's a sense of like retro causality from the, among the different elements of the time. So I fully believe that there might've been at some point a life form and in highly in, an intelligent life form, not much more intelligent than we are, but an intelligent life form able to send its water and its viruses across the universe. We are the result of those viruses. And what we're seeing now with COVID-19 is, a, this is what um, this a very important Dr. Zach Bush says, that he doesn't see this thing as a deadly killer. He sees this as a program system, as a systems update. It's a reprogramming. Why? You know what, Perhaps Bill? because our planet is where it is. So all these other creatures are just like us. They may look different. They may act different. They may bring different messages. But I fully believe that just like Borisov and Oumuamua spreading water through the universe, these creatures evolved from that virus impregnation, that terraforming of their planets. And there's a coming together. But we're all basically the same species based on virus. I think that's the big secret. And that's one of the things that the government does not want you to know. You know what? That's really uh, interesting because uh, one of my favorite books growing up and film, and this could segue to Mark into maybe expanding on this, um, is uh, The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. And uh, that book in the film basically says that the, the Andromeda virus that comes and infects that town is from an alien universe from the, uh, the nearest galaxy andromeda so it might be the virus might be a way of the, the first contact with an alien 
species. So I'm not sure. Yes. Yes. I think that's right. And the other, and the other uh, a really important Michael Crichton book that's informing us today is, of course, Westworld. Yep. And he wrote that, right? And the point is, what happens? A, Andromeda strain. What happens when human beings encounter a virus? Well, we may well find that out, not just with COVID-19, but think of what's happening as the climate changes and the permafrost is melting. <clears throat> and scientists are coming into contact with viruses, with bacteria from prehistoric times. They're finding it in the bodies of um, mastodon elephants, of saber-toothed tigers. These are viruses that maybe our, four, our ancestors had dealt with as part of their environment. But just like War of the Worlds, right? What was the point of War of the Worlds? All these Martians come in here, and they're destroying everything. What kills the Martians? Not the strongest military power on the face of the planet, Great Britain, but the cold virus. They don't have, this, uh, they don't have the immunities to the cold virus. We've been dealing with this for well over 100 years. So that's the theory there. So what happens when the same thing occurs when we encounter viruses from long dead prehistoric animals preserved in Arctic ice? Are we gonna face another Andromeda strain or are we facing it now with COVID-19, which could well be a reset to our own biological software? Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe that COVID-19 is anything other than uh, what it was purported to be um, uh, prop, you know, from the live animal market or uh, from bad or whatever. And um, it, it like H1N1 and the 1918 pandemic, I mean, we faced those from time to time. Were they panspermia viruses? We don't know that. I mean, they could be, but uh, I don't know that the construct and when they, when they uh, disassembled the virus and, and, and mapped the genome, um, it, didn't appear to be anything that was uh, extraterrestrial. I'm, I'm all for it. I think that's great. I think that panspermia could have occurred here via Mars. But I wanted to go back to what you said Bill, about the dark energy. Um, you had suggested maybe the, the universe was oscillating. That, that's the mm -hmm. theory of the oscillating universe, right? It collapses mm -hmm. and it rises, collapses. Um, we don't know. We know that it's not steady state. We know that, okay? Steady state is more just static, right? But we also know that um, the reason that dark energy actually was ever formulated came from the observations that, as you pointed out, um, everywhere in the universe we look, matter is racing away from everywhere else. Um, I have an analogy that I use when I do these talks everywhere. And it has, um, imagine a balloon that's deflated and you put all these little black dots on it. And then you inflate the balloon. Every black dot is moving away from every other black dot. And now you mentally have to make the leap to three dimensions. To, and that's how the universe works. Now, the thing is, as you blow up the balloon, the balloon is accelerating outward as you would blow it up. If you, if you just like, phew, if you really blow and, and just increase the amount of breath. And that's the observation that uh, broke modern astrophysics. Um, the universe is accelerating outward in its expansion. In 1929, Edwin Hubble, famous American astronomer, he, uh, he came up with the Hubble constant, a constant of acceleration for the universe. It was accelerating outward. So people thought, hey, at some point with all that mass inside of this, maybe that means it's going to slow down and all that mass is now going to cause the universe to collapse again. And that was actually a very popular thought. You know, a lot of astronomers thought that was possible. I thought that was possible too, you know, in, in earlier years. But <clears throat> with the finding that the universe is accelerating faster. We didn't know how to explain that. And that's where dark energy came from. That expansion rate wasn't constant as Hubble had found out. The Planck telescope told us that. Other research told us that. So now we're scratching our heads going, hey, you know, is this a problem for the cosmologists over there? Or, or is this a problem for the astrophysicists over there? What about the lowly astronomers? What do they say? You know, we don't know. And so we don't know whether the universe is ever going to collapse again, but we could be viewing the universe, for instance, and I'm going to give you a reason why what you said is not so 
not so incorrect, I don't think, because it, we, we see, for instance, that the universe, as it expands, and it's, it's accelerating and it's expanding. That doesn't mean it's going to continue to accelerate. We could be on the downward side of the acceleration. Maybe it's reducing. We don't know. So we're in that position, right? Now, the reason that what you said, though, uh, you know, is important is because recent, uh, a recent paper that I saw and I read uh, discussed how black holes seem to have, in some cases, uh, energy that's leaving them that indicates information about a previous iteration of the universe. Did you see that, Bill? Maybe you did. That paper was like astonishing because we all have, I believe, in uh, the parallel universe uh, theory. I've had experiences I cannot explain. I'm an astronomer and I can't explain some of these things that have happened to me. I can't explain them. So I'm open-minded enough to know that I can't just say, oh, that's baloney or that's crap or whatever. I wouldn't do that. You know, I wouldn't do that. And to all the folks listening, you know, hopefully, hopefully you don't do it either because it's really important to keep an open mind. That's why you're here in this conference, you know. So keep an open mind. But uh, when, I, when I think about parallel universes, that's coincident universes. They're, they exist all in the same space, okay? R, X, Y, and Z that's moving through time, that's our space. But there's another X, Y, and Z moving through time, perhaps for another shifted dimensional universe that could very well be in the same coincident space, like sheets on a clothesline that when they touch each other, okay, when they touch each other on the clothesline, that constitutes something that I've called a parallel universe intersect, which Paul knows about. We've talked about it many times. And this parallel universe intersect is someplace, for instance, where when you see that intersection, if you're there at that intersection point, might you see something that looks what we have called throughout our culture, throughout all of human culture, uh, all of human culture, a ghost, uh, an, an apparition. What is that? Is that just bleed through from a parallel universe? I had an encounter with exactly such a thing. And when I stepped into its space, it literally, it, when it ran out of the room, it took my foot with it and yanked my foot right off from under me. I had to go to the emergency room because I was, had to be treated for a, 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 a shoulder that got smashed on the uh, table on the way down, hit my head. Uh, it yanked my foot right off from under me. And in all that pain, I couldn't barely move. I was elated because I felt like, wow, if that was... If that was that, that's odd. That that could be, and at the far end, <clears throat> rudimentary communication with a parallel universe. You well, know? look at the physics of this for a second. What if I mean you compare two theories, right? Yeah. Einstein's theory: matter cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed. And Stephen Hawking's original theory about black holes: that matter was completely destroyed in the black hole. But then Stephen Hawking changed that theory and said, no, 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 it's still there, just in a different place. Well, let's speculate for a second that there are, that we live in a multiverse and that there are other universes. Well, if there are black holes in our universes, in our universe, leading possibly to another universe, wouldn't there be black holes in that universe leading to this universe? Hence the idea of universal portals that can align with each other. I, I and, understand that, yeah. That, that's a possibility. And if there's a different technology, I mean, let's just say that the different um, um, incarnations of parallel universes progressed along different spectra, okay? Some are more advanced than others that are less advanced. I mean, it could well be that what we're, we're being explored by ourselves in another universe through their black holes. And that would explain a lot of these anomalies. It's, it's possible, you know, and the other thing too is, and this for everybody too, I mean, I didn't mention this in the talk yesterday, but because uh, that wasn't that particular talk, yesterday was sort of a, a lighthearted talk about astronomy, but um, in, in one of the talks I did, um, we talk about, for instance, uh, dark energy, but we also talk about dark matter, two different things, two different reasons for existence. Dark matter exists, though, 
um, because of an observation with the way galaxies rotate. I mean, when you look at a solar system, Mercury goes racing around the sun in 88 days. Pluto is far, far away, okay, billions of miles, and it actually takes a leisurely 250 plus years to go around the sun. So we thought that stars closer to the middle of a galaxy would go fast around the center and stars on the outside would go slowly and leisurely around. And we're about two thirds of the way out, maybe a little less with the new research. But the fact is the observations didn't bear that out. Studies of galactic rotations showed that they were spinning essentially like a rigid disc. So the stars on the outside were going way faster than they should be and the stars on the inside going way slower than they should be. How could that happen? Well, that's where dark matter came from. And the word dark doesn't mean black. Dark just means unknown. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything but unknown. So unknown matter, unknown energy. That's really what they're saying. But they don't want to just admit it's unknown. Okay, but dark matter, on the other hand, they said could be um, something that has to do with coincident universes. And maybe the universal um, matter that we have in our universe, which isn't enough, by the way, to have made the Big Bang. There's not enough mass to have made the Big Bang that we can see. So there's a lot of mass that we don't, haven't found or we don't understand the mechanics of how the Big Bang actually occurred. We can see the remnants. We can see the, the afterbirth, so to speak, of the Big Bang. That's not a problem. Okay. And that is, that's pretty clear science. But we can't see all the details. And when we look at the dark matter that uh, is supposedly responsible for making the galaxies spin more rigidly, it's an encompassing matter that's all around the galaxies. So that when a galaxy rotates, it's easier if you consider there's a lot of mass outside the galaxy helping to pull those stars around as it all rotates together. So what does that mean? It means that that's actual dark matter that we cannot see, only see what it does, in our universe, or it's matter that is in another universe that's coincident with ours and affecting our universe. That is the very cool science that, well, yet to be science that we might uh, be calling science in another 25 years, uh, maybe 35 years or however long it takes. Uh, but at the speed we're going, you might find out within five or six years that one of the other is true. I think it's just a phenomenal and fantastic theory. And I think that anyone at all ages could appreciate that. Thanks, Mark. You know what? I, I've been thinking, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the uh, still with the question about disclosure um, with. Well, that was the original question, wasn't it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> but it's um, the, the physics and the science if we do have a day of disclosure that yes, the, the government comes out or, you know, hey, we do have um, off world vehicles that are not made from this earth. What are the scientific ramifications? What does the government Bible, as Bob Lazar would say, that they know, but we don't know, science does not know, well, except for a very few, a very handful amount of civilians or, you know, people in, uh, uh, you know, industry or the top scientists here in, you know, in, in America know that the rest of us don't know, especially in terms of, you know, gravity propulsion. Uh, again, I'll just uh, relay this to Bill and then we can all uh, take a turn. When um, one of the people talking about propulsion, at least in terms of at least in terms that we can understand, was John Lear, who's friends with Bob Lazar, friends with George Knapp, friend of mine. He said that the propulsion mechanism for, and which is what Bob Lazar observed himself, that the propulsion mechanism was not that these crafts move through space, but that space moves through them. And if space moves through them, then time moves through them. So he posits a, a, super, um, a super element called element 116. And he says that when element 116 breaks down, is an enormous amount of energy. So he's saying that's the basic propulsion for these craft. And okay, I mean, that could well be, but what if, what if in coincident universes, 
that it's not that there are just discrete portals. Yeah, there are discrete portals maybe here on planet Earth, like the Skinwalker Ranch, like Marley Woods. But what if at that macro level, there's constant communication, there's a constant data flow between coincident universes and our universe. And that data flow is, uh, that's what we call the paranormal. Because when a creature from that universe comes into ours, a four-footed animal with wings, I saw one of those in the Jersey Pine Barrens. We were doing an, uh, a paranormal state looking for um, the Jersey Devil. And sure enough, we have this FLIR camera, and off in the distance, there was this creature, four legs and wings. And we tried to find it, but we couldn't. But the thing is that that's what, that's the source of all these um, phenomena. That it's not as though it's, it's like woo-woo, it's actually real. That's the whole point of Charles Ford, that these are real events that, we, that science characterizes as outside the norm, but they're real. And that's why he laughed at science. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking that what we don't know is so much bigger than ourselves. And that's why if I were in the government, the last thing that I would do is disclose. Why? What do you have to gain by disclosure? I mean, really, if you think about this, uh, human beings have developed systems for explaining their reality all the way from the Egyptians, from the Book of the Dead, from ancient Egypt to the Holy Bible, the Old Testament, explains the whole business of creation, all the way through the New Testament and the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So we've developed systems to explain this, systems based on our own perception of reality. But as Mark suggests, what if that reality is so much more comprehensive and defines us in ways that we don't define ourselves in such that human beings, which when you look at our DNA, it's very little difference in DNA between human beings and, and wild feral animals. So what if the real fear is what Jack Nicholson said in A Few Good Men, we can't handle the truth. That leads me to believe also something else that Bob Lazar <laughs> mentioned in from what he's read from his little uh, briefings when he was at S4, that the aliens refer to us as vessels and they have actually manipulated our DNA structure about 64 times, 64, 65 times. What are we vessels of then? Are we DNA? Exactly. That's exactly right. What do you think this virus is? What do you think successive viruses have been? That's why, uh, that's why when I believe Zach Bush is right, when he keeps calling them system resets, as, the, as we, okay, when did climate change, at least human caused climate change, there are cycles, we know that, but when did we first begin to notice this? Go back and read Charles Dickens. Go back and read A Christmas Carol. Read David Copperfield. Read the descriptions of London during the reign of Queen Victoria, well into the industrialization of humanity. It was the age of industry that began this. Steam power, coal-fired plants, petroleum-fired plants. We are the ones that are doing this. It is our civilization that has made such dramatic changes to this planet. Okay, exacerbating. We know about La Nina, we know about El Nino, we know about all the anomalies, right? Ocean currents and everything. But what if our own industrial civilization has exacerbated the extremes? That's what we're calling climate change. It's exacerbated the extremes. Well, what if in order, and what if human beings are not ready for that? We've done it, but we're not ready for it. What if this is a reset, just like other resets have been? 
We're a colony. We're a colony of some other race. We were a colony that was engendered by the bombardment of this planet by viruses. How did viruses get here? They got, they're waterborne. They were born on the, from the water, from comets that have passed through our system since the beginning of time. And that's what we are reacting to now. And Bill, so that's what I think is happening. Bill, I, I, when you, um, I, I think that all the observations that we have about uh, climate change are, uh, they're based, they're, they're wrapped in modernity. They're wrapped in uh, humanity and how we've affected things. But for instance, I have data for carbon dioxide levels on the planet for the last 200 million years. And it's doing this the entire time. Okay. It's going up, it's going down. Um, so as far as humans being responsible, uh, we have responsibility. There's no doubt that we have some, but the planet has a, uh, agenda of its own, so to speak. I'm not going to assign it to be alive kind of a thing. I'm not a, a one of that, that kind of hypothesis, but as, as an organism, as a, as a planet, <clears throat> it has its own cycles. Uh, in Permian era, 250 million years ago, uh, oxygen was at 30% on the planet. So it was really, really high. Animals were plentiful, lots of animals. And then the great, the great dying occurred, right? And that great dying, it looks like, was a, a major volcanic eruption in what we call Siberia now. And uh, this put tens of gigatons, uh, billions and billions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere overnight. And the planet rose in temperature by 21 degrees. That's climate change. <laughs> right. Well, look at Krakatoa. The same thing happened with Krakatoa, right? It, it much, when Krakatoa much, exploded. Yes. It, and it affected... Whole, Absolutely. Temperatures yeah, dropped, the sunlight yep. dropped. What I'm saying is not that we initiated climate change. I totally agree with you. The climate's been changing on planet Earth in cycles ever since there was a planet Earth. And some catastrophes uh, as well. You right. Know, like, as you say, uh, when Tambora right. blew up. Yeah, but here's my people. point. That industrial civilization from the, let's say, middle 1700s on, exacerbated the peaks. It exacerbated the peaks to where it's caused certain chain reactions that's resulting in what we're seeing today. This is the sixth extinction of life on planet Earth right now. A species is dying every 20 minutes. Life on this planet is dying. Are we going to be the ones dying along with life on this planet? Or <clears throat> has the constant bombardment of viruses to this colony changed that? My theory is that's the kind of stuff governments do not want you to know. To me, that's the kind of stuff governments wouldn't have a clue to, to even know, actually. I don't think they know that. Um, you know, I mean, there are, the only way they could possibly know that is through academic scholars and paid research programs that are meant to search for such an answer. And, uh, and they exist. And maybe, they exist. Maybe they do. What of course, happened we was yeah. after the 1950s, after the 1950s, the government had to find a way to keep the research going without American people running off to Landers, California, and, and into the mountains to communicate with UFOs, mm -hmm. right? There had to be a way to do that. <clears throat> And here's who they had. <clears throat> Their best asset was Dean Edward Condon at the University of Colorado. All the way back in the 1950s, Roy Cohn, we all know who Roy Cohn is, Donald Trump's famous lawyer. Roy Cohn had targeted Dean Edward Condon as being a communist sympathizer. Why was he a communist sympathizer? Was he waving a red flag? Was he carrying a hammer and sickle? And no, he was a communist sympathizer, according to Roy Cohen, because he was an advocate for the study of quantum physics. And in the 1950s, the United States, the powers that be, believed that quantum physics, in part, was a communist plot. And so Edward Condon 
was part of a communist plot. Then the Air Force came to Condon in 1968, <clears throat> and they said, look, we want to get out of this Project Blue, uh, uh, Blue Book garbage. We want to get out of it. It's a waste of time, waste of money, it's a pain in the neck. We need you to put the kibosh on Project Blue Book and UFOs, and we knew if you do this, you'll come out from under the cloud of being a communist sympathizer. And that's why Edward Condon wrote that preface to the Condon Report from the University of Colorado. That's what happened. This is how careful the government is about keeping its UFO secrets. They blackmailed them. Well, how do you that's know that? I mean, where's, where's, the, uh, where's the proof of it's that? It's the letter from, okay, there are two things. One, there is all the research from Roy Cohn about Edward Condon, and there's the letter from the uh, head of the Air Force to Dean Condon, Michael Swords had that letter at uh, University of Michigan. Um, there is a letter saying flat out, we, here's what we need you to do. It's there, it's in black and white. Okay. I've just never seen it, but okay. Research it, it's there. Thank you both. Uh, we have a question from uh, Thomas. Can we discuss Project Serpo, he would love to hear everyone's opinion about that. Start with Mark. <laughs> um, I think that Serpo is uh, an, uh, a hoax. I don't really think that's happened. It, I agree with Mark. I, I believe uh, Serpo that. is the entire collection of the Serpo materials. It's basically um, excremente ex terreno, if you know what I mean. It's... <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's basically it was, it's, it's a made up story yeah i believe that as well um some years ago there was a uh, a tahoe drone uh which is actually how i became mufon's chief photo and video analyst because i had a friend in mufon who called me and said hey could you uh do an analysis of this weird thing that was photographed by this guy and it looks like there's anti-gravity things going on and all this stuff is that carrot yes the carrot, the, the carrot thing, C A R E T, and um, I looked at it and I said, "Well, the photos are clearly hoaxed, and I can actually show you why. Uh, I can recreate them." And I actually was invited to San Jose to a Mufon symposium where I actually demonstrated for the people there. I, I, I created it out live on the fly. I recreated the entire drone, um, showing them how it was made, and then I pointed out the why it was hoaxed, and I. I and I said, the devil's in the dark, and that meaning that the, in the shadows, that's where you see the failures of the rendering engines that make these CG things. And when I looked in the shadows, you saw little donuts that were overlapping each other. That's an example of too few digital samples to make your rendering. That was an example of someone who is trying to rush this out and say, let's just get this out there. This is going to be so cool. But they themselves missed the most blatant indicator that they were pulling off a hoax so when one thing is wrong when you see the photos they look beautiful but the way the photos were showing the object in the sky for instance uh that's not how cameras work there was one shot looking up at it from the ground and the sun was just out of frame to the right so it was a bright light bright white sky to the right but then the underside of the drone was in perfect view and then behind it was blue sky Cameras wouldn't show that. The cameras would have made that entire sky white if you wanted to see the underside of the drone, which was in shadow. So it is an example. Again, having taken every bad photo a camera can take, I'm very familiar with how, how the cameras work. And I pointed that out and I said, yeah, this is a hoax. And then I showed the shadow problems. That, and, and when they did this, the, the, what's called radiosity, um, when they use radiosity to uh, the, the technique to actually make these shadows and make these objects look real. Um, they failed there. And after that, that's when they said, you know, um, would you like to be our chief photo and video analyst? That was 2008. And I've been there ever since. So uh, that's not a, this thing. I'm not patting myself on the back at all. What I'm saying is, okay, there's a lot of uh, ways that people try to pull a wool over our eyes and uh, the carrot, diagram in a carrot program they also showed purported anti-gravity machines and i i 
I actually took those apart too and recreated those and said that actually that's the most simple type of CG rendering to do. It was actually harder to make the drone when they're trying to show the and prove their point. They use even simpler techniques that anyone would, you know, in their basement with a 3D program can do. Um, and I showed that and, and then pointed out why that particular thing was wrong too. So uh, with Serpo, again, here we have people that are, uh, I don't know, and, and the reason I brought it up at all about the, the Tahoe drone was because that was another case where someone was trying to push uh, an agenda about this, this, uh, this fake program that existed and try to build something around it like it was real. And, and you know, Serpo is the same thing to me. You know, so I don't think that it has any merit and I usually don't, you know, field questions about it because it's, it's, it's not uh, valuable, I think, in the discussion, you know. It but is here's here. a funny story. But here's a funny story about Serpo. <clears throat> One of the former heads of MUFON who was at NASA, worked for NASA, said that he believed and he was investigating this. He believed that there actually was, not Serpo per se, but that there actually was a UFO landing during the Johnson administration, which was the basis for, um, basically the base encounters for close encounters. And uh, uh, that landing took place. And that <clears throat> the story of Serpo was a, a fictionalization of what happened in that contact during the uh, Lyndon Johnson administration. And he was researching that. I'm, I don't have any research concerning that. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. We both know the person. He's a good guy though. He's a nice guy. Yes. He's a very good guy. Cause we asked him, what if um, you went public with all the secrets NASA has about UFOs? And I said, flat out, I would be dead the next day. It's certainly a mystery of our time, you know, unidentified flying objects, paranormal. And uh, I think today's paranormal is possibly tomorrow's science. Okay. I've that's what Charles Ford said. That's what I always said too. I mean, I, I feel that's also true, you know? Um, so I'm just going to sit back here because I, I feel like I've been kind of dominating. So uh, I let other people speak, you know, like a really and I have, and, thing. Sure. And no I've got to prep. <laughs> well, I have to prep for an ancient aliens this week. So I've got to jump off too, but thank you guys a lot. You're welcome, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for doing the show. I will be in touch. Thank you guys. I stood Good luck. You. Stay safe. Thank you guys. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Lynn. Bill. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Mark. you Mark, a pleasure. Aurelio, a pleasure. Likewise. We'll see Anytime, you soon. Days of UFO hunters. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. See you. Bye bye. Bye. So, to everyone who's here, um, I have a question from Henry uh, related to Hudson Valley UFO activity. Have any correlations been established to balance and rock formation in North Salem? I think this would be something for Melinda. Have there any been correlations in what regard to the to the balancing of the balance rock, rock in North Salem? Um, have there been sightings in that area? Is that? I think, no, I think he was trying to say that if there was any sort of relation to the Hudson Valley uh, flap uh, in, re in regards to the um, balancing rock formation in North Salem. Well, that was one of the areas where there were a lot of sightings, again, particularly in the 80s. Um, just about all the major stone formations in Putnam, Duchess, um, in that area, had a lot of sightings. So uh, uh, if I'm understanding his question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, I think uh, this is from Carl. Uh, do you think that religious descriptions of heaven or hell are perhaps related to parallel universes? I think this is something for Paul and Ben. Okay, well, uh, Ben had to bail, uh, sends his regards, but, <coughs> excuse me. But yes, um, we think that there are um, uh, descriptions of heaven and hell that, that very much uh, apply to uh, the multiversal idea. At the end of our book, uh, Behind the Paranormal, Everything You Know is Wrong, uh, and I left Ben out of it, I just wrote it myself, 
has an epilogue called The Good World, okay? And this is something that we mentioned on Coast to Coast AM some years ago, and Ben and I said, should we really start telling people about this? They're going to think we're bonkers for sure, because we have been sharing dreams. And I, I, I'd start telling him about it, he'd finish it. Uh, we would, um, it would be a, literally a world, I don't know if I call it heaven, it, was, it, it, was a, it seemed to be a place where human beings fit. And there's been some discussion uh, from Bill today about human beings not being native to this planet, perhaps. And you do wonder about that. It's, not, it's always struck me, you know, we are, we are very inefficiently built for this environment. You know, we're uh, uh, standing up, you know, our, our, our stomach and genitals are, are uh, exposed. We should be on all fours in this environment, like everybody else, so to speak. So uh, I think it's a possibility that uh, what Bill is saying is correct. But in this good world, which we would sometimes experience in waking life, there would be somehow shifts into it. Uh, it seemed that we fit much better. Uh, but people worked. Uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, the environment is very uh, conducive to human life, but it doesn't seem like any sort of ethereal or spiritual place in that sense. Uh, it seems, it reminded me of, of what the Australians told me about the, uh, the dream time. You can communicate readily with all sorts of, with just about everything else. So I think that was an example of a multiversal vision of what might be heaven. Uh, when you talk about uh, near-death experiences, uh, they're not all pleasant. We've interviewed people who've had horrifying experiences, uh, hellish, if you will. So uh, yeah, I think very definitely uh, multiversal issues uh, play into our experience and descriptions of heaven and hell. And certainly um, and they depend very much on the person since uh, according to uh, most interpretations of quantum mechanics, all outcomes are out there. And they might be very personal in the sense of what we experience and uh, Maybe uh, our own heaven and hell, that we, we, we make our own bed in the multiverse, and that might include what would folklore would call heaven or hell. Uh, it, theologically, which was, a, we did, brought some theology into our presentation yesterday, um, heaven is the presence of God, and hell is the, um, the absence of God. Uh, we did a, a very popular show, and maybe it's one of the most popular shows we've done in, in almost 13 years on the air, with a theologian, we're discussing, will Satan be saved in the end? And it, it, putting it in, in Christian terms, theological terms, or Jewish terms. And uh, there was a great a debate in the early church that said that, yes, uh, in order for symmetry to, to uh, prevail, for the justice of God to prevail, in the end, everybody and everything will be, quote unquote, saved, whatever you mean by that. Uh, brought back to the original uh, image uh, sort of, of creation. So yeah, I, I think it's a big yes to that question. I linked the answer to a short question, but uh, yeah, I think the multiverse really, uh, really does play into that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Kathleen. How did you get into um, UFOs and reverse alien uh, technology? Started out in the Hudson Valley area, having my own experiences there. And as I mentioned yesterday, attending this great group, UFOs support group, where I went every month and people would come from all over, share their experiences. I have a background in counseling and I'm very intuitive. I can really pick up on what people are saying uh, emotionally. And they definitely went through experiences. And uh, even though can't explain them, I knew they were genuine uh, experiences. And so because of that, my husband and I started to research it even more. And it's, to me, there's something going on. And maybe just because I'm speaking, I just kind of like to add on to a little bit of what uh, Paul was saying. Um, I have a lot of different interests and I explore a lot of different things and um, the field of UFOs is just one of them. But the other thing I'm very interested in is spiritual development and uh, human evolution as sort of what Mark and uh, Bill were also talking about. And so I'd like, just like to put into the discussion that I also think that it's possible that some of the beings, some of the lights, some of the 
plasma balls or whatever you want to call things that people are witnessing and having experiences with could potentially, some of them could potentially be what I might call masters, uh, could be human beings that have uh, lived on this earth, possibly like Bill was saying, uh, originally from other other places as well, but have lived on this earth, who have attained a degree of, a high degree of spiritual mastery. And I think of that as raising your vibration so that the light that's inherent in every atom uh, starts to shine and vibrate higher and it becomes um, a light body. And so I've researched things called the rainbow body where different Tibetan masters, different people from the East have uh, basically vanished, usually at the time of death, uh, vanished into light. And then uh, people that have known them, uh, their students may sometimes have experiences of them afterwards as light beings and sometimes very physical as well because uh, essentially uh, a lot of these beings are able to toggle uh, in between whatever world that is that is a higher frequency than ours and come back to our vibration back and forth but essentially they live in this other for lack of a better word dimension but I kind of don't really think of it as dimension. I think of it as the electromagnetic frequency. You know, we perceive this much, animals perceive this much, our technology perceives this much, and then who lives over there? You know, there's there's just other places that uh, beings could reside in. I don't think of it too much as dimensions, but just as a continuation of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So just to tie all that in, that um, sometimes to me, the UFO phenomena uh, correlates with uh, the existence of spiritual beings as well. So just chuck that in there. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I think that uh, you make a, a really good point that, you know, we at this point are just seeing things in this perspective you know i think uh um you know being a fan of star wars and uh, what george lucas has said about um back in the caveman days they were at zero um we are now at you know level four but the scale goes up to a million so we don't see everything we don't know everything just yet um all right we have another question uh this i think this would be uh towards Shane's experience from Thomas. Um, can you talk about the underground bases and Phil Schneider and uh, uh, everything that's happened in uh, New Mexico? Oh yeah, well, Phil Schneider, um, you can look him up. He, he's got some good uh, conferences on, lectures on, on YouTube. He's controversial. Um, some don't believe his story. I find him very believable um, in the way he tells his story. I'm, I'm usually a good read on people and, um, it, so basically he, he was an engineer bi biologist and he uh, was a subcontractor for military and he would go and design these deep underground military bases and, and he would work with them. And, and he was actually showing the machines that were used to do this long before there were photos released of these machines. Like they, it was like secret. No one knew about them. Um, but he was showing them far before the, those photos were released. And now you can find them, you know, on, on Google or whatever. But so, um, so basically he these machines would would blast away or deflagrate the rock and to bore these tunnels and at one point they he was lowered down to inspect uh, being an engineer to inspect the integrity and um said he came upon these the, this this tall gray alien and he shot it and it died and but then another one came and uh waved his hand and a beam shot and opened him up he's got a big scar and the stuff cut, cut his fingers off the electrical pulse fried his left foot and he he let, went the rest of his life with a brace on his leg um and i from the research um that i've done on him he is who he said he was he worked where he said he worked um and he supposedly i couldn't find 100 percent verification on this but from what i read was that he had an extremely high iq like 160 something IQ, um, very smart guy, but I would c encourage you, you know, make your own decision. W look at his lectures on YouTube. Um, it's, it's very interesting actually. And some of the stuff that he says we find true in some of our, you know, in our work. So, um, but, but certainly, uh, look at, look them up. And, um, that's why I brought it up. Cause you know, when we're talking about 
these mountains where these people go missing. Well, some of these tunnels are, are dug or these underground bases are dug inside the tunnels, I mean, inside the mountains. And um, some of these bases, these alien bases or whatever, are said to be inside these mountains. And actually, UFOs have been witnessed going in into mountains, many, you know, in various different areas in the world. So um, that's why I thought I brought up that, you know, so people could go research, listen to what he said and kind of bounce it off of any research and um, investigative work that they've done themselves. Because I find his story interesting. I, I, say, I don't say I believe him 100 percent, but he's very believable. You know, Wiki has no way to really verify exactly what happened to him in this firefight, but he is who he said he is and he was murdered. Um, and he said he was going to be murdered. He says, uh, because I'm, I love my America, United States of America, I'm k telling you this, and, but I'm going to be murdered. If you ever hear that I commit a suicide, it's a lie. I wouldn't do that. I love my country too much. And they found him dead. It originally said he had a stroke. Then the uh, ex-wife demanded another uh, private autopsy, which they did. And, and that coroner found a um, catheter tube embedded in his neck so deep that the original um, cornered, missed it, and they it had a hard time digging it out because it was embedded so deep. And apparently, not they found him in such a way that you know nobody could have killed themselves that way. So, um, but yeah, it's a good story. Um, look him up and decide for yourself. Gene, can, can I, uh, can I ask yeah, you? Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I was curious. Did, did you ever? Uh, and I, I don't. I know about the Phil Snyder story, and I've never passed judgment on him at all. But yeah. Um, did you ever try from the opposite side looking for records of visits to the emergency room for when he had his hands cut off or fingers cut off to see if that was uh, you know, consistent with his story? Have you ever gone from the other side to see if there was any records of that? I don't know if we could actually research it because he was um, supposedly on a base, a military base, and treated there. So I don't know if, if I haven't gone. I, I assume there's no way for us to research that. And like I said, I'm not saying that I believe the story. It's just something, if people are into this this um, type of stuff, decide for yourself. It's it's kind of interesting. It's um, fascinating. It's actually a fascinating story, the guy. You know, I I haven't, like I said, I haven't passed judgment. I know he had missing fingers. You know, of course, he's right. not with us anymore to, to talk to, but I think that it was a, a very interesting story that he had. And at one point, I was really interested in Dulce and, and what was going on down there, uh, New Mexico. So. Yeah, he's one of the more more believable ones. I mean, there's a lot of people out there just spitting stuff to to get famous and rich and and all this other stuff. But um, I don't know. He was he seemed so sincere to me. So he one thing I know it was if he was lying, um, he didn't know he was lying. I really truly believe that he believes what he's saying. Shane, uh, do you know when this actual incident occurred? Uh, what year? The firefight, I believe, was in the late seventies. Um, is, I'm almost sure like 78 or something like that. This is really interesting because um, if you look back on, again, uh, to uh, Bob Lazar's testimony and when he was at S4 and looking at those uh, briefing documents that he got uh, to orientate him on the Project Galileo program that he was working on, um, it was described to him in those briefings that the uh, aliens, the gray aliens, were working on the base there at S4 up until 1979. And there was an incident there where I guess they were working on something, an experiment, the aliens were, and a security detail were about to enter the area. Now, the experiment had in such a way where if these armed security detail coming just to check on the aliens were to enter that area that the, the rounds in their weapons were to go off and injure them. So the aliens tried to prevent the military, the security detail from actually entering the, uh, that area, but something ensued where there was a firefight and all of the security detail died because of these head wounds. So that could be something <laughs> that kind of correlates with that story, which I, you know, I never, I, I, like Mark, I never passed judgment on it. It's interesting, but yet some part of me doesn't believe it. But at the same time, if there are like these deep underground bases that they're being built, that these aliens were probably at another location working on with, uh, on a, some sort of project with, 
um, American scientists and actually American Russian scientists. There were actually Russians at S4 uh, during that time until there was a breakthrough and the Russians were ejected from the base. And uh, because of that incident, going back to that firefight where the security detail was killed, according to Bob Lazar, from what he has read, um, that the aliens left and were to return at a later date. So I'm thinking also as well, if we do have maybe a, a day of disclosure, maybe that day of disclosure is that date that he couldn't figure out. There was some, some sort of weird um, timeline that didn't correlate to like say 2020. There was a separate uh, dating index uh, code that they had. And for me, like, you know, as far as the existence of aliens and to picture if, if some of these things took place, I'm not gullible. Like I said, um, Philip Schneider is very believable. He believes what he's saying. So, um, but for my own experiences and the things that I've, I've experienced since I was a young child, um, I've encountered these things. So I know they're real. So if it, I don't question it. So it makes it easier for me to listen to these stories and not say, ah, pff, you know, this guy's cuckoo. I mean, the last encounter I had was he, we've lived in this house for four years now and it hadn't happened for a little while. And then after living here for a year and th this house has, um, like we talk about environmental factors that help these things cross over, this property has that. So we have some weird things happening here, makes it easier for these to come through. And, um, I was laying in bed. I had just laid down next to my wife. She's on her right side. I'm on my right side facing her. So the edge of the bed is to my back. I hadn't fallen asleep. I just laid down and all of a sudden I get what I usually feel when, when they're around. And, and it was like an intense, like uh, Kathleen was talking about vibration and frequency. It was that increases. Like my body starts buzzing zzz, and it feels literally like I'm buzzing. Zzz, and I'm like, Oh, they're here again. And it's, as soon as I sit, I thought that in my head, they're here again, I go completely paralyzed. Um, I've had sleep paralysis in my life, but it's associated with these things. It's not the clinical term, you know, terminology, but I know all about that as well. But I hadn't fallen asleep. I wasn't even tired. And all of a sudden, boom, totally paralyzed. I can't really talk. And what's weird about this is when this happens, when I say they're here again, they're coming again, everything is dead in the house. It's like time is stopped. And my wife, I, she's not, I can't even tell if she's breathing or not. She's totally silent. She's not moving and I'm paralyzed. And I get the thought to, I, I sleep with my nine millimeter handgun by my bed. It was shoved into a boot on the side of the bed. So I'm thinking to myself, even though I can't, can't really move, grab my gun, grab my gun. Right. And so I'm trying to roll over. And as soon as I, I think that thought, roll over, grab your gun we hear boom, 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 boom in the house. My wife jumps out of bed. My paralysis just stops. As soon as she moved, my paralysis was gone. And she's like, what the expletive was that? And I said, you know, I said, I think I have an idea. And my, we have a huge master bedroom and my nine millimeter firearm went, was completely across the room. The, the boot was not upset at all. It was still sitting exactly where it was. The, and it was, it's a heavy one. It had um, the whole, it was in its holster. It had a uh, fully loaded magazine with an extra magazine in the holster shoved into the boot so tight. If I picked it up, it would have took the boot with it, but no, something threw this gun completely across my room. And um, it, it, the minute I thought to grab for it, that's the last encounter that I had. Um, except for the time shortly thereafter, I got up in the mo morning. It was like 2.30 in the morning. Um, I didn't want to disturb my wife, so I go into the master bathroom. I close the door. Um, I don't turn on the light or the fan because I don't want to disrupt her. And so I'm, I'm, if I'm standing in front of the toilet, I got a window right here. And I look out, and it's a full moon, and I see this face looking at me. But it wasn't like a human face. It was a human-ish, but and not like a gray alien. It was orangish, and it was looking right up at me. I've gone out there. You can't see in it because the, the way the screen is and the glare, you can't see into that bathroom, especially with the light off. This thing shouldn't be able to see me, but it's staring right at me and it's looking like this. And, and I had the feeling like there was something else with it because it, it kept looking over and, um, and it looked, it was just acting weird. I knew it wasn't like, I don't know what I'm looking at, but I know um, I could grab my gun, grab my German shepherd. We could go out there and I'm like, no, because I, it's going to be gone probably by the time I get down there anyways. Go back to bed next morning, get up. My dog never goes down that embankment. And um, that now he sleeps in his kennel at the base of our bed. He can't see out the window. 
And um, we get up in the morning. I go to let him out. He flies right down into the woods, exactly where I, that thing was standing. And he wouldn't come off that spot for 20 minutes. I'm like, you know, Hank, Hank, come on, come on. And he, he wouldn't. He was just sniffing around. I took pictures of him doing it. Um, so it was certainly something there that was pretty odd. But um, that was the last encounter I had. That was probably like um, almost three years ago now. So, but hey, for me, it's easy to believe these things. Shane, a question for you on that. You said uh, when you were in that sleep paralysis mode, you, everything around you was dead. Yes. Did you ever think that your ears were just shut off? No, because it's, ha you know, it's happened to me so many times. Um, and now one time when it happened, I, I wake up. And boom, paralysis hits me. And I said, you know, I'm thinking they're here again. This bright light shines into my, it was, I fell asleep on the couch. Bright light shines into the room, so bright, it was blinding me. And I heard, burr, 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 burr. and so I'm thinking, it was that just my own self? You know, I ended up going back to sleep after I, after I freaked out a little while and woke up. This was when I was younger. I think it was in my mid twenties. And I go, I finally, you know, I, I come to and I, kind of took my breath, went back to sleep. And um, the next morning I woke up and I'm like, you know, I wonder if that noise, because I'm thinking it was just regular sleep paralysis, even though that weird bright light, it was so blinding. But my eardrums were tingly, like they were tickling, like, so something actually vibrated my eardrums. It wasn't something that I was imagining. Um, but one time when I was a child, when it all started happening, was in San Antonio, Texas, and I was seven years old. And I remember being levitated. Um, I'd wake up or I'd even just be laying in bed and notice that there would be two little ones on either side of me and there'd be a big tall one. He was the boss. He was tall, like seven foot tall. And they would always look at him and like, and he wore like this purple cloak and everything. I've talked to Kathleen Martin about this too. And she's, she's heard similar stories, but this one time, cause I would black out usually when I see them and all of a sudden I'd, I'd black out. But this one time I was levitated through my house and I'm like on my back, like, you know, laying flat and I'm being levitated through the house and I go by and I see my mother and her boyfriend at the time and they're frozen and the TV's frozen. We didn't have DVRs or ability to pause cable TV back, back in the day. Um, but everything was just stopped. It was like, I was kind of being moved through time. It was, it was now my mother would find me all over the house back then. Um, I'd be, she'd find me in the bathroom, find me in the kitchen in the middle of the night. She'd see me try to walk out of the house um, in the middle of the night. Um, so, but I would, so were they dreams? I know for sure some, some of the times that weren't, they were definitely were not dreams because I hadn't fallen asleep yet, but that's when it all started back when I was um, in Texas. That's, that's cool. I mean, if I may, um, you know, when you said you went by the TV, uh, I'm always thinking of other, other ways to look at things, right? Yeah, so definitely. So when you said it. the TV was frozen, uh, it's like time had stopped. Yeah. Well, could it have been that you were accelerated? And so relative to that, the TV looked frozen. But Possibly. you were actually moving through there much faster than you realized. And the time wasn't stopped at all. For them, it was normal. But you were just going so fast. That's an excellent consideration. I mean, that's a possibility that I always look at that. Um, and the reason I asked you about the ears was because um, I had something happen where I ended up having to go get surgery on my sinus to take out something that got stuck up there, the implant thing, I guess. Um, and when that happened, uh, I had the same problem. I woke up and I was par paralyzed, couldn't move. I mean, you've heard my story. And uh, but I couldn't hear anything. And I realized my ears were shut off. And the reason I knew my ears were shut off was because I couldn't hear myself breathe. I couldn't hear the bone conduction of my, you know, of my breath inside my head. So something wasn't right, you see. So that's why I asked you that question, but to see if maybe uh, it was a similar experience. But so you could, could actually hear. I could even hear my own voice. So when you're in the state, um, you can't really form words. So you end up sounding like a weirdo trying to call, you know, to your wife or whatever. And you're oh. like, uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, so now I can hear that. <laughs> so. Yeah. And that's when your wife says, no more drinking for you. <laughs> no more wine at bedtime. Yeah. yeah. No. No. Seriously, that, that's, that's uh, something I've, uh, I've experienced too. And it's really strange. Yes, for sure. Okay, everyone, it's uh, 3 p.m. We're going to have to end this wonderful panel discussion with our uh, presenters. Uh, anyone would like to say any parting uh, 
words or comments? Um, right. Yeah, I just want to briefly say people who want to share their stories or have questions, please get in touch with me. I'm happy to listen and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I have, I have one question, if I can. Oh, okay. Um, actually, can you just uh, do it in the uh, chat, please? Sure. I would like to say while well, he's typing his question, um, if anyone wants to you know, see things like this live in the telescopes uh, that we have, um, SkyTour live stream is on YouTube and we have thousands of uh, members now and it's all free. Uh, we have a Connecticut observatory and our Arizona observatory was just finished two days ago. So we're going to be moving equipment into that as well. So we'll have observatories on the West and East coast. Uh, it'll be really, really beautiful. And, it's a desert observatory out there, so the sky is uh, mesmerizingly dark. And um, so uh, we're going to do this live. We've been doing it live on YouTube for a number of years now. So uh, sky to live stream on YouTube. There. And they do a phenomenal job. Shameful plug, thanks. <laughs> real, uh, real quick, we have a question from, um, from Johnny. What was the last UFO sighting in Connecticut? Does anyone know that? I don't know the answer to that because uh, I could only fi find the last one that was actually reported, you know, like in the MUFON database, for instance, but I don't know when the actual last one was seen. I get people talking to me all the time, you know, did you see this UFO the other day? And I look it up and it turned out it was the ISS, you know, yeah. the International Space Station went over uh, several times this past week and it was a beautiful yellow object moving through the sky. Um, you can't miss it at night. Uh, but as far as the last one, I don't know. Uh, and I, I can't tell you. Yeah, I would say just uh, go to the uh, MUFON Connecticut uh, website, and it has all the records. It's actually pretty much, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few uh, on a weekly basis. I don't want to say a daily basis, but there's quite a few on a weekly basis if you check that website. And last I checked, you can go to the MUFON website as well, MUFON.com. And I think you can do a search as a guest on the last several cases for a particular location. Um, the, yes. the location thing is, 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 I'm not sure, but that might be what you're referring to as well for MUFON Connecticut, probably is a portal to MUFON.com. Yeah, it's, I think it's uh, what, you, what you were saying, Mark. It's uh, by uh, location and you can check out what's in that area. Yeah, yeah. And that's MUFON, MUFON.com. MUFON Connecticut, uh, okay, hey, I live in Connecticut. That's a wonderful <laughs> home to be part of, you know, with, with uh, MUFON. You know, Mike Penicello and those guys do a great job. You know. Thank you for the clarification, Mark. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, anyone else uh, in our panel uh, panelists would like to say anything before we uh, end the uh, conference? Thank you for hosting us. This was really fun. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ariella. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes, thank you so much for your effort. And hopefully we will see each other non-virtually next year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and hopefully we'll remain a two-day conference as well, too. Thank you, Emilio. Great job pulling this together. And uh, the, the uh, major podcast platforms, iTunes, that will have our show that we broadcast uh, as part of the conference uh, probably within uh, 24 to 48 hours. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Yes, Aurelio, thank you so much. Uh, as always, you did a great job. And um, so didn't all of you guys that uh, spoke this weekend. Thank you, Shane. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for being with us. So let's go out and just get something to eat, something to drink, and go outside and enjoy the fall weather. Bye. Very good. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.